We come now to the second article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. In the first article, we've focused on God as the Creator, the Almighty, Everlasting Father. And that article separates Christianity from religions of the East, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, as well as other animistic and pantheistic forms of religion. To focus on God as Creator, who made the world and all that is out of nothing by the power of His Word. But now in the second article of the Creed, we're focusing on Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Lord. And this affirmation separates Christianity also from Judaism and Islam. Because Jesus Christ is the very center and heart of the Christian faith. The second major part of the Creed moves on to talk about God the Son. The real focus of the Creed is on Jesus. When you go through the Creed, there are 24 statements of what I believe, and 14 of those are concerned with Jesus. And here we find the Creed trying to express in a nutshell the very complex and very rich Christian understanding of the identity and the significance of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Why is he so important? God has revealed himself uniquely uh, in Jesus. The God who has spoken throughout the Old Testament now speaks not through prophets, not through visions and dreams. He comes as a human being. There was not before that time, there will not be after that revelation, another revelation of the same nature. We hear not only words, we see a person. Jesus is the only revelation of that nature of God, God in human form in Jesus. We see a life that is lived. We see a death that dies on Calvary. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And there are four statements right there. And so the Creed begins to explain what it is about Jesus that is so important. And who is Jesus Christ? In Jesus' own day, this was a controversial question. Some said he was a great prophet or teacher or maybe the carpenter's son of Nazareth. Some said he was a demon-possessed man. But the Christian church answers with Simon Peter, who in response to Jesus' own question, who do people say that I am, said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so the name of Jesus has been exalted. It's a sweet and glorious name, as we've heard sung. And it reminds us that the focus of our faith is on Jesus who was fully God, but also truly and fully a human being. God incarnate on earth among us, our great Redeemer and Savior. The phrase, we believe in Jesus Christ, brings us to the very heart of the faith, but one which we often understand only at the most superficial of levels. Two words, Jesus and Christ. Jesus is the human name of the second person of the Trinity. The name that he was given at his human birth in Bethlehem, but a name with a very deep meaning by his mother Mary and by his foster father Joseph. Whenever the Hebrew scriptures talk about that God will visit us in a special way, they're pointing to someone who doesn't yet have a name. Jesus gets the name when the angel talks to Mary. It's a common name before he came and after. Jesus was uh, a, a popular personal name. It wasn't a sacred name. Jesus was uh, a name to be found elsewhere in the Old Testament and among the Jewish people. There were many people in those days who were called Jesus. In fact, the name is still used in some parts of the world today just as a person's name. It's the same name in the uh, Old Testament as the word Joshua or Jeshua. And it means literally the salvation of the Lord, or the Lord is salvation. Deliverer, 
uh, rescuer, saviour. So when the announcement of the birth of Jesus uh, took place, uh, in Matthew 1, Joseph is told, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So it was appropriate that the person born in Bethlehem in the reign of Herod the Great to Joseph and Mary be called Jesus because he was going to be the ultimate divine deliverer who would save people from their ultimate problem, which was not economic oppression or military oppression, or poverty or ignorance. Those things matter in God's world. They're, they're evils to be done away with, but ultimately the problem was the broken relationship with God and he would save people from their sins. This underlines the fact that he is the Savior. Behold the Savior of mankind Nailed to the shameful tree How vast the love that him inclined To bleed and die Today, for most people, the word Christ is almost like a surname, you know, like I'm Tony Lane and he was Jesus Christ. And it's become devalued as a result of that. Christ is not a proper name. Most many people think that it is. But Christ describes the office or ministry of Jesus as Son of God. Christ means the anointed one. In Hebrew language rather than uh, Greek terminology. It's the Messiah. It's the anointed one. The Greek equivalent is Christos, which means the same thing, the anointed one. He was the one yeah, promised in the Old Testament to the Jews, and he has come in fulfillment of that. It takes us not only to the personal name of Jesus to be the Savior, but perhaps expands, as it were, our understanding of him. Our comprehension of God is, is just blown out of the water. What seemed to be impossible in terms of the ancient philosophies, even to the Hebrew mind, becomes reality in this man, Jesus of Nazareth. His name was Jesus. Christ was not the name he was given. That is a title that, that faith attaches to Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is the Christ. Christ means the Messiah, the Anointed One. When I say Jesus Christ, if I don't say it, it's a word of cursing and blasphemy. I'm affirming I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He is Jesus, the Christ. And with that, uh, the whole idea of God is, is radically transformed. Jesus, the Christ, anointed as king, as kings were in those days, as priest, as priests were in those days, but anointed also as sacrifice, as sacrifices were anointed in those days. So this, this word Christ then adds to the meaning of Jesus. In more recent times people have taken to saying Jesus the Christ, which really is more accurate to our original sources in the New Testament than Jesus Christ. Uh, it's very interesting to see how often, for instance, Paul speaks of Christos, Jesus, Messiah, Jesus, uh, although it's translated Christ Jesus, but Paul is emphasizing Jesus as, as the Messiah, as God's anointed one. Anointed through and by the Holy Spirit to minister salvation to the human race. In the Old Testament, there's the expectation of a king after the, um, in the line of David and following in the great traditions of David, who will come? He will be anointed by God. And uh, the book of Isaiah talks about the Spirit of God being upon me, God's servant who will come, the anointed one, anointed by God's Spirit. Uh, so there's an Old Testament expectation of this great king figure who will deliver the nation. Where the New Testament goes beyond that, it takes that to one step higher, and it's a very big step, that this anointed one is not merely a king, leader chosen by God, 
but God himself will be the leader for the nation, who will bring deliverance not merely from the Romans, but from all the shackles and burdens that uh, just crush us, the burden of sin, the burden of our woe and guilt, all the mess that this world is caught up in. This Jesus is God incarnate who's come here to be the Messiah, the Anointed One, to die for the sins of the world. This is the person to whom history has been working up, that God has sent his divine agent, in fact his own self, his own son, into the world as uniquely anointed by the Holy Spirit to be the agent of transformation and salvation, not just for individuals, but actually for the whole of fallen creation. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive his from depths of hell. When we speak about Jesus as God's eternal Son, His only Son, we're not simply talking about a biological relationship. We're talking about that eternal relationship within the society of the Holy Trinity that the Father and the Son have enjoyed forever, knit together in the bond of the Holy Spirit. And this became a controversial issue at the Council of Nicaea when a man named Arius began to challenge the fact that Jesus was uncreated, said there was a time when Jesus came into being and the church really an explanation of what the Apostles' Creed had intended and meant to say all along by this phrase, His only Son. The Nicene Creed declared that Jesus Christ was the eternally begotten Son of God, begotten not made, begotten, not created, so that Jesus belongs with the Father and with the Holy Spirit on the side of creatorship, not with the rest of humanity and the rest of the world on the side of being a creature. This is a great and deep and mysterious teaching, but it takes us into the very heart of what Christians affirm when we believe that Jesus Christ is God's only Son. Evermore and evermore. There is something significant about Jesus which goes far beyond anything that can be said about any other human being. As the early Christians came to terms with the shattering impact that Jesus had had on their lives and on all that they were, they went back again and again to the Old Testament to try and find clues and models and helps. And one of the passages they went to was Proverbs chapter 8, which talks about God's wisdom. And wisdom says in Proverbs 8, the Lord brought me forth as the beginning of his work. And they said, ah, now this reminds us of Jesus. And in fact, some of the New Testament writers draw on the language of wisdom to explain who Jesus is and how Jesus relates to the Father. And for Christians, we need to talk about the idea of Jesus being the Son of God or Jesus being God incarnate. The one who comes to us as Jesus is none other than the one that's always prophesied to fill that role. So the human Jesus is, you could say, it sounds strange to say, but pre-incarnate, he is already who he's going to become. 
before the incarnation, Jesus was the second person of the Trinity. There's one God with three persons. And the second person of the Trinity is called the Word with a capital W. And when the Word became incarnate on earth, it was Jesus. There never was a time when Jesus was not the one who proceeded from the Father. Not indeed as a human being because and here it gets very complicated. Um, they think of Jesus as this divine being, God's second self, if you like, who then becomes human at a point in history. But they say the one who became human is the one who from all eternity was equal with God and was, as I say, God's second self. Jesus is indeed the Son of God. That there is something about Jesus which can only be described in terms of divinity. Jesus is divine. He is the deity incarnate. And in making those statements, what the Creed is doing is summing up the rich biblical witness to who Jesus is. For example, take the end of John's Gospel. In John chapter 20, we have this remarkable encounter between Jesus and one of the disciples, Thomas. Thomas says that he will only truly believe in the resurrection when he sees the wounds in Jesus' side. He then sees them and he confesses, my Lord and my God. And what the Creed is trying to do is to say, this is what Christians ought to believe about Jesus, that this is our response, not just Thomas's response, that in some way in encountering the risen Christ, we are encountering someone who we have to recognize as none other than our Lord and our God, none other than God incarnate. As the New Testament writers make very clear, well, as John makes clear, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. That, there, you know, that, that Jesus is not something separate from God. When Jesus speaks to us, he speaks to us as one who has the full authority of God behind him. And this means that when Jesus makes promises on God's behalf, those promises may be trusted. And when, so when Jesus talks about what God is like, he knows at first hand, and those statements may be trusted. And we know that he is pre-existent before the world because he was with the Father, and through him the world and all things were made. St. John tells us this in the beginning of his Gospel. Uh, Paul does the same thing in, in that Christ hymn in, in Colossians chapter 1, um, making, you know, making the, the eternal unity of God and Jesus explicitly clear, so that Jesus you know, is not you know, sort of one step down from God. Jesus is not you know, a created being. Uh, that Jesus is God. We are affirming that he is God from all eternity, that he is equal to the Father, that he is God in the same sense that the Father is God. Even as far back as, let's say, Abraham in uh, Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham is uh, called upon to be willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. And then it says, the angel of the Lord, who is speaking to him, says, now I know that you fear God, seeing that you've not withheld your only son from me. Well, can an angel of the Lord say that? No, every time it's the angel of the Lord, as compared with an angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's the second person of the Trinity. God taking a certain form, a certain appearance, and speaking to his people. He is God's son. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. Remember, in his prayers, Jesus called God his father. There is this unique, intimate relationship between Jesus and God the Father. Colossians 1 says of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That is taken in the sense of the heirship. He is the heir of all creation, and in him are given all of the inheritance. Same thing in Psalm chapter 2, where the Lord says, uh, you are my son, today I have begotten you. What is meant by that is I've produced you, I've presented you to the people as the heir of, of everything. God tells us, isn't it, in Deuteronomy, that, that there are some things that he has revealed to us 
and some things which are still his own secrets. And I think the exact nature, the defining nature, the relationship of God the Father and God the Son, we can't expect to be able fully to encapsulate in words like a legal definition that will satisfy everybody. Part of the problem, of course, here, as with much theology, is that we're straining at the borders of language. And that's not something to be ashamed about. Um, if we could simply put all this theology into a test tube and cook it up and see it, then it wouldn't be theology anymore. It would be chemistry or physics or something. Um, but we shouldn't be surprised that our language gets stretched to the limit. But that should make us humble and reverent um, because we're actually treading on very holy ground here. And if God is God, I mean, if God is just an idea in my head that I can play around with, then who cares how I'm rearranging all these ideas and images. But if God is God, then it really matters that when we're talking about him, we're talking about the one who made us, who loves us, and before whom we must one day render an account. So it's important to realize that these are only our human words uh, to describe a reality which is bound to be far greater and beyond them. Of the Father's love begotten, ere the worlds began to be, He is Alpha and Omega, He the source, the ending He. Of the things that are that have been, and that future years shall see evermore and evermore. <laughs>Creed affirms that Jesus Christ is our Lord. He may have been a human being and he may have been a saviour, but there is more to this Jesus than, than that. And uh, one of the earliest affirmations, the Apostle Paul refers to it in 1 Corinthians, is what distinguishes us as Christians is the affirmation we say Jesus is Lord. The early Christians used the word Lord for Jesus, both to address him and to talk about him. And it's a complicated word because in their world, the word they used in Greek was kyrios, and that was quite a simple word at one level. Lord simply meant you were over somebody. You could be Lord of the manor, you could be Lord of the vineyard, you could be Lord of Galilee, you could be Lord of anything. Um, a teacher could be a Lord. It was a polite term. If you were in school, you might refer to your school teacher as kyrios. It would be like in English we say, sir. Um, you know, excuse me, sir, can I do this or that? So it's just a polite way of talking about somebody. But then the same word goes all the way up the scale. And quickly you discover that Kyrios, Lord, is a title, and it's a royal title, and it's a title that Caesar, the emperor in Rome at the time when Jesus was born, when early Christians were going about their business, Caesar claimed to be the world's Lord. He was sovereign in the ancient world and people attributed to Caesar from time to time uh, ideas of divinity. So to say in a Roman dominated world that Jesus is Lord is to make a counterclaim. When they're calling Jesus Lord, they're actually upstaging Caesar. They're saying Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't. That's why Paul gets put on trial in Acts chapter 17 for saying that there is another king namely Jesus, and it's clear that this is seen as a threat to the Roman power. And to make him Lord of Lords and Lord of all, as the New Testament does, puts him not only over against the human power of Caesar, but far over in superior terms to that position of Caesar has in the world. But it doesn't stop there, it goes on, because a lot of the passages from the Old Testament that the early Christians quote when they're talking about Jesus as Lord are passages which in the Old Testament are using this word Lord to refer to Israel's God. This is a divine title, Kyrios. Now this is a complicated bit of the story, but it's very important because in the Old Testament, 
by the time it came into the Christian era, many people read that book in Greek rather than in Hebrew because Greek was the common language of so much of the world. And when they took the personal name of Israel's God, Yahweh, they translated that into Greek as Kyrios, Lord. The word Lord relates to the Old Testament word Yahweh, the name of God. And so it is ultimately tied in with the affirmation of the deity of Christ. So when the early Christians quote a passage from the Old Testament about Yahweh, and they quote it as referring to Jesus as Lord, they are well aware of what they're doing. I'll give you an example. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, and 11, Paul says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. At that point he is quoting from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23, where it is Yahweh who says, To me and me alone, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. And that's one example out of many in Paul where you've got an Old Testament text about Yahweh, Kyrios in the Septuagint, coming through into the New Testament as a reference to Jesus. And then Paul goes on triumphantly, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Kyrios, to the glory of God the Father. Now, Lord there is much, much more than just Sir, just a polite way of talking to somebody slightly senior to oneself. Yes, the word Lord is used sometimes as a title of honor to human beings. But in the strict sense, Lord is a title we ascribe only to God. So in calling Jesus Christ Lord, we are again affirming his Godhead. He is fully human, but he is not only human. He is God. It's a way of combining these two things. Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't. Jesus is the Lord, the Yahweh, who we know in the Old Testament. And that enables Paul to do something that he can take the word God, theos in Greek, and the word Lord, Kyrios in Greek, and he can put them side by side so that though he knows that God and the Lord are in one sense the same being, equally divine, part of the same monotheistic entity, he can talk about one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. And that's a way for Paul of getting at the mystery of the Trinity. Now, from that point onwards, it naturally follows that if Jesus is Lord in any or all of those senses, one of the things that has to happen is you have to do what he says. So when we say Jesus is Lord, we really do mean he, he is sovereign, he rules, he's over all. And for us to say it not only as a statement uh, uh, of faith about the role of Christ in the world, which is true, but we're also saying that he is our Lord personally. And therefore, we're saying that he is the governor, the boss, the controller of our lives. And all that we do comes under his lordship, and we are to live in obedience to him. It's been said that uh, unless Jesus is lord of all, he's not lord at all. There's no point calling him lord, lord, and then ignoring when he says, now I want you to do this. But that, in a sense, is a rather low-grade spin-off. That's merely filling in the footnotes that we've got to do after all the glory that has been revealed to us. But nevertheless, it has to work out in concrete, specific, definite Christian obedience. But that obedience has to include the worship of the one who in the Old Testament is known as Yahweh. And it has to include working out the social and political meanings of saying that Jesus is Lord and the great emperor is not. Take an example way back before uh, the early days of the Second World War, a group of uh, German theologians uh, devised together the Barman Declaration and in it they affirmed that Jesus was Lord and that they were as Christians and as a church in Germany answerable to no one else but to Jesus as Lord. So they were not bound to go down the road of obeying Hitler as many Christians did in their compromise which led to all sorts of evil and to the uh, onslaught of the Holocaust and the evils of Nazism. Uh, declaring Jesus to be Lord frees us uh, dramatically in that case from having 
to bow down to any other lords who are going to serve us ill in comparison with the way in which serving Christ will do. So the Lord means you're surrendering your life to him, but in surrendering that life, uh, you're not putting yourself under the way you would to a dictator, a, a, an earthly king, a totalitarian ruler, a tyrant. You're giving it to somebody who serves you. But it means we identify with Jesus, who uh, was a servant of all. He uh, washes the disciples' feet. Who uh, put aside his own wishes and desires to serve us and to save us. Jesus is the one who has been supremely obedient to God's saving purpose. As Paul says, obedient all the way to the death of the cross. And so the obedience of Jesus to God's plan then molds and shapes the early Christian idea of what it means now to be a follower of Jesus. It means to obey God like that, to obey the God we see active in Jesus. And so then we move from the idea of God as the supreme creator to Jesus himself as the Lord who demands our allegiance and our obedience, not because he's setting us random tasks just to see if we will do whatever he says, but because the things that he asks of us are the things whereby not only we become more fully and truly human beings ourselves, but whereby we can take forward his purposes for the whole world. You can believe all things about, all sorts of things about Jesus. The question is, is he Lord? I believe Jesus Christ, our Lord. We need to declare Jesus is Lord. Materialism is not Lord. Fashion is not Lord. Image is not Lord. The political powers of today is not Lord. Even democracy, good idea though it may be, is not Lord. But he reigns supreme over all. One of the powerful images of this is, is in John's revelation in the, in the letter to the church at Laodicea where Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Now he's, he's writing this to Christian. This is a Christian community this letter is sent to. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into them and eat with them and they with me. Now, if you play with that image, see, what's that door? It obviously is some place in our life where Christ is outside and we are inside. And we are inside without him. He is shut out. So it is some place in our life where Jesus is not Lord, where Jesus is not present. So it is that it is some area of our deadness, it is some area of our darkness, some area of our sinfulness, some area of our brokenness. And what did Jesus say? He doesn't say, if you'll clean up your act and come out. He says, if you'll open the door, I'll come in. He will enter into that darkness. He will enter into that deadness. He will enter into that brokenness. He will enter into that sinfulness. Whatever that pocket of deadness in our life is, he will enter in and nurture us. I will eat with you and you with me. He will nurture us to wholeness right there. When he is our Lord, it means that our time is his, our hopes are his, our dreams are his, our possessions are his. We live for his glory. We think Christ-likeness is alien to our humanity. It's, it's as though God is trying to impose something on us from without. When, when in reality, Christ-likeness is the essence of what we are created to be. Christ-likeness is the essence of our wholeness. And so what God is doing in Christ is, as I mentioned earlier, is, is entering into our alienation, into our separation, into our rebellion, into our deadness, into our darkness, entering in cruciform love in order to restore us in that relationship for which we were created, that divine human relationship, that we are to be in loving union with God, that that is our wholeness. Paul speaks of Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is no longer I who live, Paul says, but Christ who lives in me. See, what's he talking about? He's talking about himself as a human being, being indwelt by the divine reality and finding life in that mysterious union of God 
Christ, the Holy Spirit, with him, Paul, the historical human being. And, and that's what's so significant to us, is because what God did with Paul, God wants to do with us. Lord, in the strength of grace, with a glad heart and free, myself, my residue of days, I consecrate to Thee. Thy ransom servant, I restore to Thee Thy own, and from this moment live or die to serve my God alone. Beautiful words of Charles Wesley. And they remind us of the absolute allegiance and loyalty that we owe to Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. When we call Jesus Lord, we're using the church's most universal name for our Savior. And it reminds us that we belong to Him, body and soul, in life and death, for all time and eternity. In 2 Peter, we have this beautiful benediction. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and for all eternity. Amen.